Hello, church family. Welcome, and we're glad that you can join us this morning. And as we wrap up the month of January, and uh, as we come to a conclusion of our preaching series, Disciplines of Godly Living, uh, we are going to today wrap up. And as we wrap up, we're going to look back at the first four topics that we've covered. Communion with God, Scripture-led prayer, discipleship in the local church, true godly fellowship, which all will speak into today's tying up the series in God's mission to the world through the church. And so I'm delighted that today Pastor Matt is going to help us think through that, the implications of that to the church and what that means to the world that is longing for true light and true hope in Jesus Christ. And so uh, having said that, we're also going to move next week into a week of fasting and prayer. Both Fellowship Pickering and Fellowship Bruce Park will do this. In fact, you will see a link below to the prayer guide that we're going to use from Monday to Friday, from February 2nd to February 5th. And it'll be emailed out if you're on our email list. Otherwise, you can find it on the link or the description below. And each church will have particular days where you can call in. We'll have prayer calls. And our prayer is that we can think and meditate deeply on these realities that we have looked in January, all five topics, and take one day each next week, Monday to Friday, and pray them over our hearts and the life of the church, that we would enjoy the Lord and make Him known. For our call to worship this morning, we're going to look at John chapter 6, verse 35 to 44. And so I want to ask you to join me as we read that. John chapter 6, verse 35 to 44. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I say to you, you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do the, my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him, because he said, I am the bread of bread that came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother were known? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me has drawn him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Let us pray. Father, we thank you today that you sent your son, the Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, that you come to save sinners. We thank you that as we gather at the end of this month, as we think through the topics that we have thought through, communion, prayer, discipleship, fellowship. Thank you that ultimately Christ is the bread of heaven. Thank you, Lord, that you use your Holy Spirit to draw men and women and children all around us to the gospel. Thank you that is your work. And so may you now, Lord, bless our time as we sing, as we listen to your word, as we pray. Help us to respond to your love and in obedience. May you be glorified and may you anoint our brother even as he teaches you word. We praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died by richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. love and sorrow meet, or thorns can pose so rich a crown. Oh, the wonderful cross, the wonderful cross, bids me come and die and find that I
nature of mine that were an offering far too small love so amazing so may truly live and all who gather in my grace draw near and bless your name we bless your name
you alone can rescue, you alone can save, you alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us, let us out of death, to you alone belongs the highest praise, to you alone belongs the highest praise, to you alone belongs the highest praise. Good morning everyone, my name is Sam Sandoval, I'm an elder at Fellowship Church Rouge Park, and today I'd like to read the Psalms to you. Uh, chapter 51 to be precise, and then I'll lead you through prayer after uh, we're done reading. So if you could turn with me to Psalms 51, it reads, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment behold i was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me behold you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart purge me with hyssop and i shall be clean wash me and i shall be whiter than snow let me hear joy and gladness let the bones that you have broken rejoice Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness, O Lord. Open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good in Zion to your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Amen. Let's pray together through this psalm. There's many attributes of God that are present here that can be praised and we can revere. And let's start with praising him. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much because you are merciful, because your steadfast love endures forever. And we come to you as sinners and you are faithful and able to cleanse us from our sins. Your judgments are blameless and you alone can create a clean heart. By the blood of Christ, we have been washed to those who put their faith and trust in him so that our transgressions are no more. And we thank you for that. You show us your grace and you give us great joy in knowing that we have life and we have been forgiven and you have given us a new life in Christ Jesus. So in response to this, Father God, I pray that you help us identify and know the hidden sins within us, the iniquities maybe that are hidden within us that we uh, have not brought forth to you. Help us be able to have a contrite heart. Uh, forgive us, identify in us what we may confess, what we may change, and through your Holy Spirit, you will be able to uh, transform us and make us holy and set apart for your purposes. So we request to you, Lord, renew a right spirit within us towards you, towards our neighbors, towards each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. May we be humble, may we be loving and compassionate with each other and gracious as you are gracious to us, Father. Forgiving as you have forgiven us, Father. Help us have this spirit within us so that we would be imitators of you, Father God, and bring you glory and honor. And so we are ready, Father God. We are ready because you go with us. Help us teach others as we encounter them of your truth and your love and the life that we have in Christ Jesus. Help us share the gospel and make disciples as you have commanded us, that we would declare your praise, that um, we would be the salt of the earth, that we would be the light of, in darkness in this world, and that 
Others may see the joy and the love and the life that we have in Christ Jesus and that they may be drawn to you, that we would have compassion on the lost as you did Jesus, because you said you did not come for the righteous, but for sinners. And you have saved us and help us partake in your kingdom purposes and in your plans to save the lost, that we would also have compassion for the lost and share your word and your truth and your gospel. In the powerful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Good morning, church. I'm excited today to speak to you about evangelism. Evangelism is one of my passions. I I love to pray and to think on and to pursue lostness. As a matter of fact, it's one of the first things I think on as soon as I wake up in the morning, as soon as I get in my car to drive somewhere, uh, as soon as I lay my head down at night, I, I, I seem to constantly think about those who are without a personal relationship with Jesus. And it deeply, deeply bothers me. It breaks my heart. There are times where I weep over the lostness in my life and in the harvest. Today, I want to speak to you about the harvest. The Bible tells us that there is a harvest and it is plentiful, but the workers are few. I want you to take your Bible today and turn with me to John chapter 4, verses 34 through 38. You know, I want us to pause here for a moment and I want to pray again. I know we've already done that together today, but I want us to pause and pray. I just want to invite the Holy Spirit to fill me, to anoint me as I teach God's holy word. Let's pray. God, once again, we say that we are desperately in need of you today. God, I don't want to give my opinions. I don't want to give my thoughts. God, I don't want to give a motivational talk or speech. I want to open up the holy, perfect, living word of God, and I want you to change lives because of it. And so, Holy Spirit, I know and recognize right now that I need your anointing, and I need your power, and I need your touch in order to speak on your behalf. And so, God, I pray and ask that you would touch your word today. That you would breathe, Holy Spirit, life into every viewer right now. God, I pray and ask that you would be glorified in our time together today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You know, as you get older in life, oftentimes you find yourself reflecting back on your childhood. I don't know if you ever do that, but but here lately it seems, I don't know if I've been feeling nostalgia or whatever it may be, but I've been looking and thinking back a lot about uh, yesteryear. And the other day, one of my children was asking me something and all of a sudden a truth hit me like a ton of bricks. You know what I'm talking about? When all of a sudden you realize something and an epiphany hits you, a light bulb hits on, however you want to say it. And the truth is this. There is nobody else in this world other than my wife Erica and myself that is more influential and has more opportunities to invest and to shape the hearts and minds of our four children. And I thought to myself, wow, it it seems just like yesterday that I was an acne face, you know, teenage kid. And and here I am now a parent of a 13 year old, a a 12 year old, a nine year old, a five year old. Here I am now a parent of four kids. You ever just pinch yourself and say, wow. But not only am I the parent of four children, get this, I'm a pastor. And, and oftentimes I, 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 can't, I can't fathom the idea that, that I am now a parent and not only am I a parent, but I'm a pastor and I'm responsible for the spiritual growth of people's life. You know, I don't know if you ever reflect back on your past. I don't know if you ever ask those questions. How did I get here? What am I doing? Where did all those years go by? And when you and I were growing up, typically we would say something like this. In the future, I am going to do this. Or one of these days, I am going to do that. 
And now we say, well, one of these days, we're going to do this or we're going to do that. We said it when we were kids and we're saying it now as adults. But friends, while planning is good, healthy, and even biblical, it's good to be organized. It's good to say one of these days. It's good to think on the future. I'm here to tell you this morning, the future is present. The future is now. You say, Matt, what do you mean by that? We're going to look at a passage today that's one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. John chapter 4, verses 34 through 38. And leading up to these verses, Jesus had just now encountered the woman at the well. Do you remember that? She comes to Jesus and she's there doing her morning routine, drawing water for the people around her and in her life. And she encounters Christ. And and Jesus confronts her about her idolatry towards men. This was the idol in her life. And he offered her living water that could only be found in Jesus. Leading up to that encounter, the 12 disciples, they had gone off into town to get some food and some resources. And they come back and they say, Lord, eat some, eat this food. And do you remember what Jesus says to the 12 disciples? He says, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. The disciples are like me sometimes, if I'm being honest this morning, most of the time they're slow. They didn't get always what Jesus was talking about. Can I get a witness? And they don't understand what he's trying to say, but because he's gracious and because he's good and loving and kind, and as Pastor Casey and I talked about last week, he's making disciples. He's slow with them and he teaches them and he answers them in our text today. The Bible says this, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and Harvest a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. Verse 38, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Jesus is saying not tomorrow, not next week, not Sunday, not in the future. But Jesus is saying now, now is time for a harvest of souls to come into the kingdom of God. Over the past several weeks, we have been in this sermon series, and it's been such a joy with, to do it combined with Fellowship Church Roos Park and Fellowship Pickering. And we started the series off by looking at our communion with God. Pastor Beneath taught us about how we must have our chief desire must be for God above all else. And then we looked at how we seek the Lord in prayer through praying his word through scripture as a means of worship. The past two weeks, Pastor Casevan has been speaking to us from the word about the importance of Christian fellowship amongst the saints. And then the, the call to actively, every single Christ follower, actively to make disciples that make disciples. This is our calling. It's been a great series on the disciplines of godly living. Today, we're going to conclude the series by focusing on the discipline of evangelism, engaging the harvest. Because, beloved, here is the truth. If we are abiding in Christ, if Christ is our chief desire, if we are in fellowship with the saints, if we are making disciples, then we will share the good news of Jesus. There's a song my family has been singing. You probably remember it. We have family worship time every morning in our house, and it's a song called Spring Up, O Well. Spring Up, O Well. And when Christ is in you, wherever you go, whoever you speak to, whatever you encounter, Jesus will spring up like living waters. And he has to get out, and he has to be exposed and you have to tell people about Jesus. This is for all of us. If we are madly in love with Jesus, 
then we'll be madly in love with the lostness in this world and desire to bring them into the kingdom of God. And today we're going to center our time together around two primary questions regarding these words of Christ. The first question is this, what happens to our lives personally when we focus on the harvest? Have you ever asked that question? What happens to my life when I focus on the harvest? Secondly, how can you know for sure that the time is now for a harvest to come. So our first question, what happens to our lives when we place our time, energy, and resources into the harvest? Here it is. We can be assured that we are centered in the will of God. When we are focused on the harvest, we can know without a shadow of a doubt that we are focused on the will of God. John chapter 4, verse 34. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. What happens when we focus on the harvest? We can know that we are centered inside the will of God. Have you ever asked yourself the question, God, what do you want me to do in this circumstance? God, what do you want me to do in that situation? God, what do you want me to do with this problem or that problem? God, I need your help to make the right decision. God, I long to be in the center of your will. How many times, beloved, have you actually prayed that? God, I long to be in the center of your will. God, show me your will. God, show me what you desire here in my life. Of course we have. Because even though some of us learn quicker than others, we have learned over the years collectively that as followers of Jesus Christ, The last place that we want to be is outside of the will of God. Pain comes when we are outside of the will of God. Bad pain. Now, when we are inside the will of God, pain can come as well. Persecution can come as well. But that's good pain because we're obeying what Jesus commands. You say, well, Matt, how can I know for certain that I am inside the will of God? It's very simple. Listen to what I'm about to say, church. We obey what God has told us to do. Wow. Have you ever wrestled to the point when you're like, God, show me your plan, show me your will, show me this, show me that. All the while, there are facets of our walk with the Lord that we are not even obeying Him in. Did you know that there are 1,050 commands in the New Testament for Christians to obey. That's just the New Testament. Due to repetitions, we can classify them under about 800 headings. They cover every phase of man's life and his relationship to God and his fellow man now and the hereafter. He commands us. All throughout scripture, God commands us. He commands us to pray. He commands us to love. He commands us to do what we're doing right now, sitting under the the teaching of the Word of God. He commands us to abide in His Spirit. He commands us to be baptized. He commands us to be joyful in our suffering. He commands us to watch for His return. He commands us to give of our time, talent, and treasure to His local church. And He commands us to do the will of His Father. And what is the will of the Father? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It is the will of the Father that we engage in the harvest on a regular basis. You say, why? How do, how do you know that? Because He longs to use us as His vessels, as His hands, and as His feet. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. We call it the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Pastor Kay talked to us about that last week. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is our edict. This is our command. This is our mission. This is what we do. Did you know there are so many Christians and so many churches who are just... They're just kind of getting by. And maybe you're watching this today. And you say, I've repented of my sins. I've placed my faith and trust in Christ. But I'm just kind of getting by. 
I'm just kind of biding my time until I get to heaven. Do you ever wonder why you feel that way? Do you ever wonder why there are so many believers that don't feel energized in their walk with the Lord Jesus? I believe it's because there are so many people in the family of God that are deliberately disobeying the will of God. Not taking his command seriously. Not obeying what he's told us to do. But when we place our attention on the harvest, we will not simply just get by, but we will thrive. Why? Because like Jesus, food nourishes you. It replenishes your energy. It sustains you for the work at hand. Our food, like Jesus, is to do the will of the Father. As we enter into a week of fasting, some of us are going to be called into a fasting from food, sustaining from other things. Where will we get our strength from? Where will we get our nourishment from? We will get our nourishment from the will of God. The word of God, the living bread of life. Before we move on, let me just say this. I'm seeing a lot of self-pity in the body of Christ right now. There, there's a lot of conversations that I have each week. And, and there seems to be a lot of woe is me that is taking place. A lot of that going on. In, in love, I just want to say... That does not honor Christ. Listen to me, Fellowship Pickering. Listen to me, Fellowship Church Rouge Park. I know that this is a difficult season right now. I know things are not as we want them to be. Here's a news flash for us, though. They never will be until we're in heaven forever. But, beloved, we have so much to praise Jesus for. Amen? You say, man, why are you saying this? Because in my life, when I am constantly and consistently having pity party parties and feeling sorry for myself, guess what I am typically not doing? I am not engaging in the harvest. And therefore, I am not doing the will of the Father. Church, we all get down. We all get discouraged. You want to know one of the best ways to rediscover the joy of your salvation? Listen to me. Tell somebody about Jesus. Don't, don't, don't retreat in, into a pity party. Don't retreat into your feelings, into your emotions. Ask the Spirit to fill you with His anointing and go talk about Jesus. I, I'm, I'm getting texts all the time from people around North America, church planners. How, how, do you, how should we share our faith right now? What should we do? You know, how, how are you telling people about Jesus? The same way we've always done it. Put on your mask. If somebody will let you talk about Jesus, put on 50 masks. I don't care. We got to get the gospel to people. We got to get the good news to people. And right now, Satan is discouraging the body. He's trying to convince the body that, that, that nobody wants to hear the gospel. Everybody's scared. Listen to me. Church, people are wide open right now to the things of Christ. We've got to talk about Jesus. It's a great way to obey the will of the Father. When we are engaging the harvest, we can know without a shadow of a doubt that we are centered in the will of God. Our second question, how can you know for sure that the time is now for a harvest to come? Are you ready for it? Because Jesus says so. Like, period, <laughs> right? Like, when Jesus says something, that's it. I grew up with a dad who was a disciplinarian, man. And when he said something, you better do it. And let me tell you something. When our, earth, when our Heavenly Father says something, we better do it. And when Jesus says something, we can take it to the bank. We can't always trust people and people's words. But when Christ says something to us in His Word, we can deposit it. John chapter 4, verses 35 through 36. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. Notice the exclamation point. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Open your eyes and look at the fields. 
What are the fields that Jesus is talking about here? He's talking about Scarborough. He's talking about Pickering. He's talking about Ajax and Oshawa and Bowmanville and Coburg. He's, he's talking about all of Ontario. He's talking about all of Canada and North America and China and India and Turkey, the Philippines. He's talking about the world. He, he's saying the fields are wide unto harvest. Church, listen to me today. He's begging us to open our eyes. He tells the disciples, open up your eyes. The fields are wide unto harvest. How can we believe that this is true? Because Jesus Christ says so. Because Jesus says it's true, and that's it. Oh, Matt, but you don't know my community. You don't know my neighborhood. You don't know the people in my life. Uh, yeah, you, nobody wants to hear the gospel. No, friends. Remember, the future is present. The future is present. Why? Because Jesus says so. I remember several years ago, I was suffering for Jesus down in Tampa, Florida. And I was preaching at a church. And this lady came up to me afterwards and she said, you know, we're just in a casual conversation. I can see this lady in my mind even as I'm speaking. And she tells me, she says, I just got out of prison and I don't have a driver's license, but man, your message today on sharing the gospel was so impactful. And I want you to know, I share Jesus all the time because he's changed me and I love him so much. She said several times, I go down to a busy intersection and I pass out water bottles. And I pass out the gospel and I, I even talk about Jesus and I share the gospel. Anybody that will listen, Matt, I don't care, anybody that will listen. I said, wow, that's great. Listen to what she said to me. She said, yeah, I've only seen 66 people come to Christ, but I'm trusting for many, many more. And man, let me tell you something. My heart was broken. For all the times that I had such little, small faith that God could save people. She started asking me about the GTA and the statistics that we have here in terms of churches and losses. And I share with her the statistics of the amount of losses. And here I'll never forget her words because she challenged my way of thinking. Listen to what she said. She said, oh, it must be easy then with that many lost people because you know that the fields are white unto harvest and there must be many people there that God is preparing their hearts to receive Jesus. You see, maybe, just maybe, we don't see the number of people coming to Christ like we could because we don't take Jesus' words to heart when he says, look up. Because the fields are white unto harvest. We can trust that a harvest is coming and it will be brought in because Jesus says so. And finally this morning, when it comes to the harvest, we can trust that a harvest is coming because others have been laboring before us. John chapter 4, verses 37 to 38. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, Jesus says is true. I sent you to reap, he tells the disciples, what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you've reaped the benefits of their labor. A few summers ago, we knocked on the door of a young man and we asked him what he thought about Jesus. And the young guy said, Jesus Christ, uh, the swear word. And we said, well, no, Jesus Christ, the person. He said he'd never heard of him. Never heard of the historical figure of Jesus Christ. Never heard the name Jesus before outside of just a swear word. That's all he knew it as was a swear word. And there are people like this guy all around us who have never heard the name of Jesus. But you know what you'll discover? 
If we will engage the harvest on a regular basis, everywhere we go, and no matter what we're doing, if we will talk about Christ with people, wherever we are, you know what you'll discover, church? People are open. People are actually spiritually curious. Now, I know as soon as I say that, you're thinking about the time that you tried to share Jesus with somebody and they turned you down cold. Hey, listen to me. You can't focus on that. You have to go back to what the Word says. The Word says that a harvest is for now. The future is present because others have been laboring before us. John chapter 6, verse 44 says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up the last day. See, the Holy Spirit of God goes before us. And he is preparing hearts. And he is going to use you. It is God's miraculous, glorious design that he would use us to tell others about the good news of Jesus. But you don't do it in your own strength. You don't do it in your own power. You do it through the Spirit's mind. And secondly, Jesus is telling us in this passage right here that we can reap what we haven't even worked for. Man, that's, that's a pretty good deal, isn't it? That we can reap a harvest when we haven't even labored for that harvest. Others have done the hard work, Jesus says, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. See, listen to me. We stand on the shoulders of men and women who have been proclaiming and sowing gospel seeds for years and years and years before you and I ever arrived on the scene. And sometimes with our egos and with our pride, we think like, you know, we have this hero complex. We're going to show up and save the day. You don't save nobody. I don't save anyone. Jesus does the saving and he uses those who will humble themselves before him seek to be full of his Holy Spirit's power and anointing and believing and trusting that God is with us and that we will reap a harvest that we didn't even work towards. How many Corneliuses, how many Lydias are potentially out there in an area of what? Two and a half million people that the Fellowship's Network is trying to engage on the eastern part? of this region a lot of people you see we want to both work for the harvest and benefit from the work of others to receive a harvest that glorifies God let me say that again we want to both work for the harvest that means going out on a regular basis engaging the harvest being in relationship with lost people going up to people, sharing Jesus, passing on gospel tracts, however we need to do it, whatever we need to do it. We want to both work for the harvest and benefit from the work of others to receive a harvest. So we don't know where we are in the line. We could be the first person that shares the gospel. We could be the sixth, seventh, eighth person that's shared the gospel. That's why we have to keep a posture of humility as we see people coming to faith in Christ. Always giving God the glory. Always knowing it's His hand. It's His work. As we close this morning, there is a book entitled The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And I'm sure many of you have read that book or seen the Chronicles of Narnia movies. That's written by a once skeptic toward the gospel named C.S. Lewis. And in the book, there's a character named Aslan. And he's a great lion, but he's not only taking a talking lion, but he's also the king of this fictitious kingdom named Narnia. I'm sure all of you have heard of this. And most importantly, this lion is a symbol that is representative of Jesus Christ. The book is about four siblings who stumble into this fictitious kingdom. I want to close this morning by reading one of my favorite lines in that book. It says, and I quote, they say Aslan is on the move. Perhaps he is already landed. I love that line when they say that he is on the move. Because Jesus is on the move. Jesus has been on the move for thousands of years. When he came and he began to 
set up and build and establish his earthly ministry from the ages of 30 to 33. And then he turned those ministries over to the apostles. He, he, he descended from heaven then ascended back. And now he sits at the right hand throne of the Father. And he's never stopped being on the move. What does that mean he's on the move? He's redeeming man, woman, boy, and girl for his glory and for his honor. Jesus is on the move. And here's the crazy part, church. Listen to me. He wants to use us. He wants to use our giftings that he has blessed us with to build the kingdom of God. And we cannot grow weary, as Paul tells us in Romans, in doing good. No matter if there's a pandemic, no matter what's going on in our lives, we cannot grow weary in doing good. We must obey the king's commands. Every single Christ follower watching this today is born again because someone shared the gospel with you. As we close today, I want to ask you a couple of diagnostic questions. Number one, is somebody holding you accountable to share the gospel on a regular basis? Do you have somebody in your life of course, your elders, we, we hold you accountable in doing that. And we need accountability in doing that from you and from one another. But do you have a brother or sister in Christ outside of your leadership body that is saying, hey, have you been sharing Jesus? Do you, are you in relationship with lost people? Do you have friends regularly in your lives that do not know Christ but know that you know Jesus? And that he is your everything. The third question I have for you. Do you know how to share the gospel? You know, if you've been born again, then you, you must learn and you must equip yourself with a deep desire to share Jesus. And if you don't know how to do that and you want to know, please reach out to one of us. And we would love to walk with you about how to share Jesus, but don't overthink it. God so loved the world that he sent his only son, Jesus, and whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. If you're watching this today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, friend, you can repent of your sins right now, right where you are. As the Holy Spirit is convicting in your heart, revealing to you your need for purpose, your need for new life, your need to be reconnected to your creator. You can repent of your sins right now. Believe that Christ died on the cross. Confess with your mouth that he is Lord. Believe in your heart. And the Bible says you will be saved. Commit your life fully to him. Christian, we get one shot at life. Let's make it count. And remember, stop saying one of these days, one of these days, I'm going to be an evangelist. One of these days, I'm going to talk to folks about Christ. One of these days, the future is present. Tell people about Jesus now because Christ is coming back. We must obey the will of our Father. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We praise your holy name. God, I'm overwhelmed thinking about your great love for us. How you loved us so much you sent us your son. God, forgive me when I don't share my faith as I ought to. Help me to grow. God, give me a passion a deep, deep, deep abiding passion, a stronger desire than I have even now, Lord, for the harvest. Give to every single person listening and watching this, God. Every single member at Fellowship Pickering, Fellowship Church at Rouge Park. God, every elder watching this, God, ignite within our hearts a deep desire for lost souls. God, we're all going to do it differently. You gifted and wired us all differently to reach lost people. But God, I pray this specifically. I pray for boldness. I pray that we would not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
This world is going crazy. It always has been. And God, now so more than ever, we need to shine the light, the gospel light. And we can't be ashamed of the gospel. And we can't back down, Lord, from wickedness and the enemy. We must stand on truth. And God, we must boldly proclaim the greatest message of all time that you love us and that you died for us and that we can have new life in you so I thank you for that God bless my brothers and sisters today bless us God this week as we seek to grow closer to you through fasting and prayer be glorified Jesus in your name we pray Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My chains are gone. My Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good. My hope secures He will my shield and portion be As long as life endures My chains are gone I've been set free My God, my Savior ransom me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace the earth shall soon dissolve like snow the sun Forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be forever mine. You are forever. are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood His mercy reigns unending love amazing grace my chains are been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing
amazing grace, an ending love, amazing grace. So thank you again for joining us, and I pray that through the Spirit, our hearts have been ministered to and our minds are motivated and that we are led to consider the reality of the harvest that he, God uses some people to sow the seeds others to water he gives the increase that he has sent his son to be the living bread the bread of heaven and so even as we think through this may we be motivated by love and obedience to consider those around us who don't know the Lord Jesus may we pray for them may we approach them Maybe we be a witness to them, and may they be drawn to Christ. And so again, reminder that next week we're going to be doing a time of fasting and prayer, Monday to Friday. Uh, the link to the guide should be below the video description. And if you're part of our email list, you should be getting it on the email. And so for our closing uh, passage, we're going to look at John chapter 4 and verse 35. Here's what the Lord says. Do you, do you not say... There are yet four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for the harvest. God bless you and may we consider the harvest and may we be praying for it. May we live for the glory of God, which grants us great joy, which, be, which becomes a blessing to the nations. Thank you, God bless you, and we hope to see you again next week.